me on mic etiquette, like if I'm okay, like okay. Darth Vader or something, like let me know. <laughs> okay, I'll let you know. First thing, I'll let you know we're live right now. Right <laughs> we are live. Welcome back to the show. I'm Hank Strange. I'm broadcasting today, not from the Big Daddy Gun Studios. We're on the road. We're supposed to be doing our vacation here. Let me make sure that you guys can actually see me. We're supposed to be on vacation, but um, hey, I'm still working. I have to uh, deal with Lola about that later. We're in the Ozarks. We're in beautiful Branson, Missouri. Um, very beautiful country. I love the mountains up here and all the great things going on. And one of the cool things that I like about this place, a lot of people who have heard of Branson know that there are a lot of performers, singers that come from around the country to perform here. And it's great. We saw some of those uh, shows yesterday. What's the name of the guy that we saw singing yesterday? Sorry, Remember the guy that we saw singing yesterday, Lola? Remember who that Ashbury. was? Um, yeah, we saw Alan Ashbury. Alan Ashbury, I think, performing somewhere. So that's awesome stuff. But another cool thing that happens here, there's lots of people who make things in this area. So you can actually go. There's lots of craft stores, etc. And there's even some parks some of the oldest parks, uh, recreational parks in the country that you can go into, kind of like, you know, how you've got Disney and Universal. And in there, there are people, there are live people actually making all kinds of different crafts. There's blacksmiths and there's wood craftsmen and leather makers and people making quilts and blowing glass and doing all this beautiful stuff. And you can you can buy these things and and have some cool things to take home with you and actually talk to these artists and artisans and craftsmen, etc. So what that brought to my mind is a friend that I met in Arizona recently, Mr. Blake Hernandez of BMH Knives. He makes some beautiful knives. And I wanted to have him on to talk about making things. What's going on? Hey, Blake, how's it going, man? So you want to just tell folks out there who might not have heard of you, you know, who you are, what you make, well, Blake Hernandez from BMH Knives. Um, we make custom handmade knives over here in Phoenix, Arizona. Started off making it for all the good boys, firemen, some PD down here, and just it spread locally. And here we are today. We ship and sell knives across the world. Small, small artisan batch. I'm not trying to act all big time here. Small artisan batch knives that we make, but across the board i can't i can't pick a genre <laughs> right I, so I, go ahead you were saying you can't pick a genre why is that i can't pick a genre of a uh, cutting tool edge it's just anything that cuts i try to make <laughs> okay so do you consider yourself a blacksmith a bladesmith knife i mean how 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 do i name you what i'm not sure um i just i'm so broad and i try so many different things uh, uh bladesmith is good um, blacksmithing is uh what I started off at in uh, building a small, a small forge out of a brake drum, but then moving into the production knife industry, you got to put that aside. And that's just been my hobby. It's my passion. But now going back to it, uh, going to blade show and seeing all these uh, true artisan come out of the woodworks. It's just been amazing. I mean, they've been there the whole time. It's just, this industry has just seen a new influx of, of people who are, Awesome and thirsty, ready to, to pound out some steel. Okay, so here, I'm going to ask you this question because you just mentioned the Blade Show. But while you're responding to me, I'd ask you, like, while you're talking, hold up some of those cool knives you have there so that the folks who are joining in can see the kind of stuff that you're actually making. So this was the first time you went to the Blade Show, right? Uh, second time. Second second year there, um, just hanging out, never, never displayed there, just – meeting people I, I love networking um in any industry that i i work in and just being first time in, in in a space where i can express myself artistically and i'm alongside with people who do the same you just meet a lot of cool people so really taking my time and seeing who's out there and seeing who's who's producing awesome phenomenal art that inspires me you know and pushing the envelope on uh, not only creating knives, how to streamline them, bring, bringing them to production, bringing everything in house, and, and handling that whole piece also fascinates me. I mean, you get to see everything in that at Blade Show. 
So tell us a little bit more about Blade Show. Is that like, sh basically that's SHOT Show, I guess. Um, and does it take place <laughs> in Atlanta every year? Shot show. Let me tell you that. SHOT Show is a crazy experience. Nothing touches SHOT Show. I was uh, honored enough to be able to make it a SHOT Show. We ran into, into each other at SHOT Show this year. But man, I'm telling you what, the just enormous size that SHOT Show brings to the table. You can't touch that. But yes, yeah, on a smaller scale. But this year, Blade Show really... Man, there was a lot of numbers there this year compared to last. Oh, okay. So it was really, really growing. There's handmade kids just wanting to make stuff with their hands. It's just incredible right now. Oh, okay, cool. Now let me um, let's let me check something here. Um, Walter, my friend Walter Keller from Safety Harbor is saying that we're not live yet. Let me make sure that we're we're live. Lola, are you seeing us going out live? Yeah, okay, yeah, Lola's watching us live, Walter. I don't know what's up with your internet or whatever is going on over there. You need to get your <laughs> get your internet act together. I, I don't know. I'm surprised hey, I'm doing as well as I am right now, being next to the mountain and the preserve out here. Sometimes it's hit a yeah. And this is your first um this is your first live broadcast, right? You've this never is my done first anything. Live broadcast. And you, Hank was kind enough to land the plane. Land, land the plane safely and on the on the tarmac. This is my first time. He he hooked me up with the headset. And yeah, move over a little bit. You're kind of like we can only see half of your face right now. You're drifting off in your seat. There, they go. a little bit more, a little bit. Oh, okay. I'm be awesome. a pro at, at yeah. this. <laughs> yeah, listen. Um, I, this is not my first one. I've done a couple of them, but I still don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> So you were telling us about Blade Show. I want you to keep uh, throwing up knives, and then while you're throwing up stuff, just let us uh, know it, what kind of knife you're throwing up there so that we, uh, right. folks out there that want to comment can tell us which ones they're interested in. This one here is a custom Havoc um, from my half-inch line of knives. This is half-inch 01 tool steel. And my, my thought and design behind this knife, you can throw this – very well. I've I've since run into some people in the industry. Um, my buddy Jason is a combat knife thrower, and he can absolutely whirl one of these <laughs> from forty yards. It's insane. So really, in seeing him throw and building knives, kind of inspired by his uh, his combat throwing style, okay. as he's allowed me to make some of these, but also adding the double tank bottle opener. So, oh, okay. So that's a bottle opener there. Now, is this one finished? I'm, I'm assuming it isn't. This one, all all I have left is a leather handle wrap. Again, these lines of knives, I want it to be simple. You could almost just take this as it is, sharpen it, and throw it. And mm -hmm. this is Cerakoted, dual Cerakoted, um, military grade paint. So it's really durable. It's really tough. Uh, the the heat treat on this, it was triple normalized. And that's a process where the grain structure of the steel gets really refined, really strong, and then you temper it, and um, it can really bounce off stuff and still keep the very hard edge. So, and, okay, and so finish. okay, so let me ask you: with that knife, I mean, I know so that pattern that we see on there, that's cerakoted in. Yes, so it's a single base cerakote. My buddy Gypsy Knives, he does all our cerakote here in Phoenix, and he will take a base paint, bake it, and then he'll do his artistic pattern on it. This was just a blood splatter, gray on gray. So that's all just artistic embellishment at that point. But it, it is military gray Cerakoted on the base coat. Just Okay. Dope. So so how durable is that on a knife? I mean, and what purpose would you use this knife for? Well, being that this is 01 tool steel, you get a lot of properties being high carbon steel. Um, it's can retain an edge really well. It can sharpen pretty easy. It has all the performance aspects you want, but it rusts. So what we do is we just coat the whole knife with uh, the Cerakote. Um, it's very durable, um, impact resistant, obviously the toughest paint you're going to get. Obviously every year we were at SHOT Show, they were coming out with some crazy stuff out there with their coatings and whatnot. But uh, we, we got a good supplier here locally that we stay on top of all that. Um, either way, it just makes you have both high points of performance. Now, now you're having the uh, durability or the um, erosion resistance of stainless steel with the performance of high carbon, basically. 
Okay, cool. So, so when you send those out, the it's not the blade's not sharpened. Um, to get coded. Yeah. Correct. I mean, no, no. When you when you, I'm sorry. When you send it to the person buying it, that it does it then have a blade on it, or they have to take it and get it sharpened? Oh no, no, no. They they all come. You're you're catching all these knives in various processes of the custom production right now. I don't have any knives in stock at this point. So these are just customs I pulled off of the shelf. So when they get their knives, they're sheath, lock, load, ready, sharpened. They're ready to go right out the box. But for unfortunately, this is the only ones I have for display today. Oh, okay. So okay, let's let's see another one then. All right. What what else you got in here? Let's see. I'm not gonna kick out of this. So this is a full titanium blade. And if you ever mess with titanium, that stuff is out of the comic book, man. It's really yeah, what Wolverine's claws are made out of. So what's fascinating about titanium is just the durability of it is almost indestructible. It's so light, but it can't have a it can never be called a hardened tool edge because it doesn't have the carbon um in it. But there's this new thing called carbonizing. If you can see the discoloration on the edge compared to the untouched titanium up there, that is carbonized, small arc welded, infused carbide into this chisel edge on the back. So when you sharpen it, you get the durability of titanium and you can cut with it now. So oh, it's, wow. Yeah, it's a very fascinating process, but we make a line of titanium carbonized like so, to so what would a knife like that weigh, and what would the cost be? I'm assuming that since it's titanium, we're looking at a more expensive knife. Yeah, right now, these are only available per custom order, and my books are closed at this time. Um, these get um, more shot off in the collector's market and more one-off small batch, batch artists. And like, let's say I would do a run of five of these and take time and um, double anodize them, carbonize, wrap, sheath um so these would go around 350. 350 okay so pretty much everything you make comes with a sheath with a leather sheath of some sort yeah well now that's interesting you're, you're bringing that up i'm starting to make kits like i said a lot of young kids at blade shows starting to make their own knives and not a lot of people can pull out 350 for a custom titanium you know rare self right. well so I'm starting to make kits where these kids can come in at any process of the knife game and say, I want, I want support in this area. I can buy my leather. I can, I can sew and everything. I just, I can't, uh, grind or heat treat. So I can send them out, grind heat treat blades and they can finish the rest of them or vice versa. If they need sheets, I can support them with sheets and stuff like that. So, Oh, cool. So people who do have the ability to do some of this or are interested in doing some of the work, it's an entry level, it's a, a way of entry into getting these custom knives. Yes, absolutely. Cool. Absolutely. So I, it's, I noticed there that with the leather, are you doing the leather work yourself or is someone else doing that leather work? Well, and here's the interesting thing. I'm bringing all the leather work in house. Um, I've done, done it both. I have a, a really good guy who does amazing custom work. And again, the, the way I've, I've, understood or interpreted the knife game as far as the business side goes to it i just treated it like a custom house because when i did it that way i say okay then i can network with another uh, concrete pour i don't have to be that i this is my hand finished concrete you know what i'm saying it'd take me forever to build a house if i was going to bring it you know but i can right take the same structure and say okay i got a leather guy here i got a serico guy here i got a heat treater here they're all local i can build a team you know i can help support local. i love supporting local i got a good guy so he, if you really want a one-off leather sheath i got a guy john lewis down here and he does the most fantastic work he was ahead of my leather department for a couple years now help support grow my business to where it was because you can only make so many knives in a week as one person. And on top of that, you can only make so many sheaths, you know? So that was the first thing right. that me, but like we talked about before we went live. If you're looking at this as a hobby, you have to treat it differently. If you're looking at this as a livelihood, 
you know, there's certain things you're going to have to let go and focus more on the actual knife making. So he, he took on a lot of that uh, production and it absolutely fantastic Leatherman. So, um, I am now bringing laser technology into my leather game. Therefore, again, I can up production. So this is all done at ASU. Okay, so it seems so guys can get um, stuff custom lasered into the sheaths. Now, yeah, now so I'm now that I'm not hand sewing everything myself. I'm saying, hey guys, I found a shop who's allowing me to use their la laser and you know and build these kits from there. So I go there with my my sheet of uh, shoulder, half shoulder, and if someone needed ten sheets, we would laser up their pattern put in the CAD program, uh, obviously tailored to their knife, go print out their laser sheets, send it out in the kit, and that would be part of the kit. But for right now, this is the kind of quality that's coming out in my production. It's all folded over construction. These rivets are each 75 pound test each, so right. okay. just breaking later. Mm -hmm. So that's basically the direction I'm kind of going. Being a one-man show, you know, you can only do so much at this time. And right. So breaking it out that way just made more sense to me mm -hmm. also keeping all the blake signature now if you see a, a blake signature lying around that's all done by me in house 100 percent, start to finish and that's how oh, that's cool so what so what is that knife you're showing us right now this knife here is the bmh tonto it's a creation i made and this is the first production run of this Tonto. When I say production, there's, um, they're still all handmade. And this is the only knife I'm making in house, 100% by my hands. All the other lines are, of knives I have right now are either being outsourced at some point in the production line. Um, but right now, this Tonto here with the Tsuba and Fuchi it is a unique proprietary system on how I lock this all together. Eventually they're going to be interchangeable. You can change the scales, you can change the Tsuba, you can change the, the Fuji and just kind of have a, the most customizable fixed blade on the market is what I'm So your, your knife is more unique. That's very cool. So uh, let me ask you a few questions here. I, I, before I get into the serious questions, um, someone made a comment about, let me see, uh, um, a knife gun. <laughs> Someone was asking about a knife gun. I think that, you know, they're referring back to some stuff that we've seen here in the past in the show um, with a trainer that was doing some, some stuff where he was using a knife and shooting at the same time. What do you think about that, though? I know it's a little bit silly. Um, basically, I interpret that as just life support, like secondary life support. And that's what mm -hmm. these are really fashioned after, very small, very sleek. And the way the, the belt is constructed, it is just very malleable. So this goes horizontal carry. I'll just show you. Oh, so that runs carry. right into the side of your belt. Right into the side of your belt. So it's really flat and malleable. So like, like me, if you've done left over, you don't get hot spots. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, right. Yes, I know. <laughs> it's uh, it's very comfortable and very accessible. So I'm I'm assuming he's talking about if he's going to be tactical to using a gun or if his gun gets compromised. He has a life support here, and it's out of the way. It's not big. It's not bulky. You know, it's it's doing one thing. It's going on someone's neck, and that's it. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Is I'm it, not absolutely sure. We'll, you know. Yeah, I'm not absolutely sure what he was talking about. We'll let him. Um, talk about that you know i know that we were seeing that you you probably have no idea of this but we did have uh someone on that does like some crazy training with a knife where he's stabbing the um he's stabbing the attacker with a knife at the same time that he's shooting them i'm not sure that that he was talking about that he could probably you know he could probably let us know um I would or maybe he was just referring to like a gun knife kind of thing i don't know you know that's probably a little bit more complicated than what you're making right now. Well, and when, when you get into the tactical side, and again, there's a lot of guys who buy from me, and, they, you know, they, and they're way more accomplished in knife fighting than I am. Mm -hmm. So they give me a lot of tips and tricks and ideas of how and what units work and what don't. So again, but at the end of the day, it ends up being a perfect EDC knife. Like half of, 
half the time you're taking it out and you're cutting your shoestring off. You know what I'm saying? I don't, last yeah. time I've been in a vicious knife fight was never, but you know, it happens. But again, it's however you want to use it. it. It's it's not there. You don't feel it. You never know it's there. It's very sleek. It's conforming to the body, and uh, they're sharp. That's that's basically it. Yeah, the way, the way that I would think, I agree with you with knives. I, I do EDC carry a knife. I'll show the one that, I, that I'm that i carrying right now. This is a Spyderco, let's see, what is this? Spyderco CPM S30V. Nice. It's a very lightweight thing. Um, I believe I actually got this from the late Boy Scout as a gift when he uh, came to visit. And we were he came on the show and talked about knives. I'm not like a big knife guy. You know, I do more gun stuff on the channel. But... I'm thinking about getting into it, so it's something something that I want to start getting into. And so for me, oh, carrying God. some like you said, carrying something like this is for opening boxes and stuff yeah. like that mostly. You know, I do have something else that I carry. Usually I have some other kind of backup that I'll carry in case my hand I can't get to my, you know, my right hand, which is my gun hand. If I can't use it or I'm in a struggle with someone, I could get something else to kind of get them off me. And that's where a knife would come in handy, right? Yeah, and that's when I would always, if you're going to tend to worst case scenario, I would always fix blade, fix blade, fix blade. There's, there's just too many variables into opening stuff. I know there's a lot of very functional opening blades out there, but when it comes down to it, simplicity, that's why the Tonto is just so simple. And I just yeah. love the design of this, and it's just, it is what it is, you know. It's a sharp cutting tool edge. Use the tool as you please, you know, as absolutely. it suits your needs. Right, absolutely. So uh, let me get into some questions here. I'll go through these questions and then we'll go on to more of our conversation. So someone out there wants to know if you have tips for someone who's new to knives, um, so far as the buyer, like what should they do as a buyer if they're new to knives, like I just said, and they don't know a lot about knives, what do you what would you look for what would you say they should focus on when they're buying knives when when, when you focus on buying a knife especially a custom handmade knife i'm assuming that's where he's more leaning towards oh just know it's it's there's many ways you can skin the cat so get more stuck on the knife maker and what he represents and then you will always love the knife if, if you go after like i need this knife it needs to be this and needs to be that you're never going to be happy you know what i'm saying Fall in love with the process. Understand that it's a handmade knife. Understand there's flaws. We're not CNC machines. You know what I'm saying? Understand that it's the whole idea that we're we're completing and, and doing this task. You know, from start to finish with with the creations of of you you in mind. You know what I'm saying? Of making you guys happy at the end of the day. So note that fall in love with the maker. You'll never you'll never be upset about the knife. And especially if you pick the right one, they're they're gonna they're gonna stand behind the word. They're gonna they're gonna fix what's wrong. They're gonna know about customer service. You know what I'm saying? Okay. So if if folks out there are looking, what I'm gathering from what you said is that like figure out what maker you want to deal with first, right? Is that what you're saying? Or, so like their style, like does their style? Okay. Change? Yeah, it's like the, yeah, it's just like art. If I think people say that if you're looking at art and you're not an art expert, which most of us aren't. Start mm -hmm. with what kind of art do you like? So if you see if you see someone like the the knives that Blake is making, I like the beefy macho ness of them. I like that you you, you it seems um, you always use some copper elements. Is that because you're in Arizona? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I like those copper elements. They're very masculine. Your knives. So if you say, "Wow, I like that," then you go then you go then you once you've identified that you like that artisan, then you go to them and try to get them to custom make something back that further and, and just see how they, they run things overall you know just there's there's a certain relationship between uh maker and collector or maker and uh, art enthusiast whatever you want to call whoever's buying into you as a knife maker there's this, this unique bond that happens so make sure you don't overlook that because when both parties overlook that then you got the, the whole you know, now I'm a consumer, a consumer against, uh, you know, you get that whole unsatisfied. It's, it's hard to be unsatisfied when you have an open line of communication with the maker, but that's because you've, you've selected them uh, wisely, you know, because there's so much out there now. There's so much to pick from, you know, yeah. take 
Um, take your time. Really give yourself time to fall in love with it, and then you'll you'll understand it. You understand what it takes for us to do from start to finish. You know, rather than just rushing in and saying I just want a product because of X Y Z. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think it's a yeah. It's a uh, if I think you're hinting at the customer. Um, like manufacturer or maker relationship that sometimes might get strained because you know you've got that thing that the customer is all, always right but in this case you're dealing with a custom with an artisan that's handcrafting this thing for you and there's certain things that I'm sure that you have some things that you don't necessarily want to do right so so even though someone's paying you to do something you might say yeah I don't really make that or I don't believe in that style is that even yeah, even further going into okay, if you're, you're towing the line of buying first custom hand and that you don't know like I don't know if this is worth it. If it's not, if you question yourself, is it going to be worth money? You're not ready. You haven't spent time under that one maker looking at his stuff every day. And be like man, I'd be like, oh man, that guy's a cool guy. I really like how he talks. I really like you know what he stands behind. Eventually, once you make the jump into a full custom knife, you're buying into the maker more or less than the knife. You know that's irrelevant. That's that point because he's been validated. He can make knives. He's made a lot of knives, I'm sure. You know what I'm saying? Give yourself time to fall in love with the process of being part of history because there's only a few of us out there, and I know it's growing. This market's growing, but uh, at the at the end of the day, these pieces are going to be around long after we're done and generations after that. So it's basically you know, there's a, there's there's more of a romance to it that once you get into it, talk to some of my collectors. That's it. They they can't wait for the next one. You know what I'm saying? And I can understand that. Falling in love with some of these other knife makers I deal with, and some of my friends, I'm like, I can't wait to get the next Tony Nickel. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. it's it's really a process that you wanna, if you want to into it and get into it and get into it, but wait wait for that moment. You know, it, it yeah. mean rather than just rushing in and being disappointed, and like man, I spent this much money, you you, you lost sight with the yeah. Understand the, the whole patience. Thing. Yeah, understand the whole patience involved there. Okay, let me go on to some, because um, a lot of stuff is coming through my head, but I want to make sure that I get these questions for folks out there, because I'm sure they have a lot of questions about this, and they probably don't get to talk to someone um, like this unless they're actually buying something. So um, the question here is, what is the turnaround time? Which I guess is relative to what we were just talking about. Yes. So that, that all depends. And again, it's different for every maker, and every maker goes through a struggle of books being closed, of too much demand and, and I'm sorry, yeah, too much demand, not a su supply. So my answer to that, it just depends. I'm right now building a, a smaller production line of knives where, again, I'm either taking my lean manufacturing tips I've learned and made and applying it to it so I can produce a bigger yield and or subbing out uh, some of the processes to laser, you know, so I'm not hand stitching stuff. Some of the turnarounds on those customs are two to three months. Some of my Blake signature customs are closer to nine months, but that all just varies on what you're ordering and at what part of the custom uh, ladder are you ordering it from? How much am I involved into it? You know what I'm saying? Yes. You know, one of the things is that there's, I think for we, I'm going to say somewhere in the 80s probably, right? In the 80s and 90s. Um, and even in the beginning of the zeros, we got into this thing where everything had to be mass manufactured and be there really fast. And, and maybe as a society, we got away from people like hand making things. But we're starting to get back into it now. There's a huge resurgence in that where people are like falling in love with stuff that's handmade. Like the re maybe it's because now we're so disconnected from each other every day that we really, a lot of us are commuting like, co communicating like this. Right. And here's the thing, what's funny, like, so you take this one peccary, for example, and it could take me, let's just say, eight hours to make one peccary, but I can make 10 of these in 30 hours, you know, and that's because of the way I understood lean manufacturing and I actually applied those skills. The same thing that back in the 80s, like you mentioned, we kind of got out of control. We focused too much on that, so much that we're like, we're lean manufacturing so much, we're not even doing the work, we're shipping it overseas, right? But mm -hmm. now we understand, like, wait a minute, me as an artisan, I can still make the same knife just because I'm I'm applying lean manufacturing position to my shop and the way it's arranged and, and the tools I have to build to produce this at a lower price, that doesn't devalue this. 
that actually adds more art, another layer of art. I know guys who are able to scale businesses because they can understand lead manufacturing and not only just create a masterpiece once, but create it, you know, in a buffet setting that's hard to do. Yeah. So learning that trade and keeping it in the house and learning how to do it, that I'm all for, you know what I'm saying? That, that definitely yeah. speaks to the strength of learning those traits, but helping yeah. us you know, keep your, your own house strong. Right. Right, absolutely, and I, and I think if we if we're getting back into this thing where we want things that are handmade, we we kind of have to like switch over the mindset of where you order something on Amazon and then like Amazon's going to where you can get that thing in that day within yeah. a few hours, you know. And this is not a situation of that. It's going to take some time. Of course, the thing that really bothers people out there nowadays is that you know there's there's some shysters out there or people who take money from them and then they never get things. And I and and that's why I think. You know, definitely everything should be buyer beware. Yeah, yeah, and watch out. You, you look at this, and this is this happens in every industry. Once it starts exploding and growing really fast, be, buyer beware. And that's why I always say, fall in love with the maker first. Like, get 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 time to know them. You know, time it builds trust. Time is just trust, right? Basically. Yeah. So get time to know them because there are the companies who take the money up front and they'll take loads. Of payments and then you'll never see them again but again you're, you're kind of matching the same vibrational state in the person who wants something quick they, there's that there's that always that pitfall of wanting something quick and fast you might get caught you know yeah absolutely so so let's go to the next question um, here uh, actually someone wants to know like what's your training that you have I know we were talking behind the scenes before we started this I think you're training right now as a blacksmith but if you just want to tell people like what education training experience do you have for making uh, knives? self-educated um, I didn't even know there was a knife industry until I was deep into it <laughs> so um, as a knife enthusiast just carry knives my whole life always worked with steel um, Arizona, uh, Arizona certified welder Again, wasn't until I started making and forging knives uh, from home until I trained myself. So last three years, I've just been cutting stuff, making stuff, building a shop, <laughs> you know, diving into it. I guess YouTube, YouTube, I, I guess would, I can uh, get my, my search from <laughs> my blacksmith <laughs> search. But, you look at a lot of YouTube videos like a lot of folks do uh, out there. So you've just so you've been doing so have you actually been making these and selling these for about three years? Is that what I'm getting? That's correct. Oh, okay. I, I, so, I, I focused it as a bit like I said, okay. At the time I was uh like we'll find my insulation business here in Arizona. So I was I was looking for my next venture. I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna go for the knife thing and I just went all in. <laughs> is that your cell phone I hear beeping? No, um, that, oh, I don't know if that's computer. it might be my computer that is synced to my cell phone. So Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, because I'm hearing that ping across the thing. So what um so you're doing blacksmithing as well, right? That's correct. Oh, okay. Are you are you training with someone or apprenticing, I guess I should say? Um, that right now, Phoenix well um I am apprenticing under Grizzly, Grizzly Forge and down Phoenix downtown, so okay. he is my old yeah. gate, he's my old gate guy from 2008. Back when uh, I used to remodel homes, used to be a superintendent. He he just used to make the most fantastic. I'm talking. You want to talk piece of art and, and how to manipulate? Mm -hmm. Go check out uh, Grizz <laughs> Grizzly Forge. He's on Instagram. His his work, his metal work is is far beyond what I've seen out there. But he's been doing a long time and he's gotten into knife making and he's been gracious enough for me to use some of his power hammer and equipment. You know, and I've I've uh, went out to his shop and kind of just apprenticed around and uh, helped build gates in his production line. Pretty pretty fascinating uh, setup they got over there. So Okay, very cool. Yeah. For anyone who wants to see Blake's stuff, you can definitely go on um, BMH knives on Instagram he's he's very prolific on Instagram puts up videos pictures all that kind of cool stuff all the time so you can see what he's doing there and then the last question that I have here before we just get back into our regular conversation which is kind of along the line someone wants to know 
Uh, for a person who's interested in making knives, you know, how would you suggest they go about it? I know you've done it one way. So with, uh, with your knowledge and experience of how you've gotten to this so far, how would you advise someone wanting to get into it now? What would you advise them to do? I advise them to um, gain as much knowledge as they can. Research, um, start small. There's, there's a way, if you want to do it as a hobbyist, I mean, that's probably the, the most fun you're going to have. <laughs> if you want to turn it into a career or, or make some uh, part-time cash selling knives, that's a whole different thing. Right now, just focus on making your art, focus on enjoying it. Um, understand there's a learning curve. If you understand that there's trial and error, you're not going to get, it's going to take a long time for you to be proficient on your grinds and to get it to look how you want to express yourself. If you can understand that, I would say it's more put on that mindset of uh, it's going to be a long, a long trial, but it's going to be rewarding once you can think, figure it out. So take your time. Yeah. yeah. So let's say, so let's say, like uh, for example, uh, you know, I think, wow, you know, I like the idea of making knives, and I don't have any tools or anything like that, and I wanted to make my 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 first knife okay. from scratch. What what's the process? What does that look like? Go go to Jance, Jance.com knife supply. That's the basic, most basic bar stock pick, 01 tool steel. Uh, find find something around the $20, $23 dollar range. Get it shipped to you. Um, you can get a, either a 1 by 30 Harbor Freight grinder. They're like 40 bucks. You can. That's what everyone starts with. If you, if you think you're a little bit more accomplished from that, step, step into a 2 by 42 Craftsman. You know, get your feet wet with those two grinders. There's plenty of YouTube videos on there on how to grind a knife. Learn how to make a soup can forge. It's okay. very easy. All this stuff I'm telling you guys can do, you can do with Lowe's, Home Depot, and, C's, and Sears, you know? <clears throat> so this can all be done um, fairly inexpensively, and unless you're jumping into the 2x72s, which are pretty expensive. But I, I would stay out of that range until you get your feet wet. Build a, fruit, a soup can forge. And learn how to quench and harden your first steel knife with those tools. That's all you really need. And then from there, it's it's all about you're going to get hooked and you're going to drive yourself to learn more. And right. That's how so it's, it's so it's all like a trial and error kind of thing, right? Absolutely. Find yeah. good credible sources. I, I have a, a story mode I do on Instagram. I basically show you guys my whole production line. Like there's my skirts up. There's nothing I don't hide. So. A lot of people learn a lot from that. So just find a valuable source of information and uh, go with it. Yeah. Do you ever do any kind of do you ever do any kind of instruction or classes for folks even in, in locally in Arizona where you I, are? I'm, I have. I've done a lot of private mentoring. Um, I have yet to kind of uh, scale that up a little bit, but I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about holding maybe a Saturday class. For local guys who can come and want to start learning and getting their hands wet and figuring out what that looks like, that that could be soon. Okay, cool. So, what about apprentices? I mean, do you have people who maybe don't know anything and they want to get into it, and they're local mm -hmm. to you that they can come in sometimes and and maybe train with you? You can, you know, show yeah. them the ropes, kind of a thing. Um, I have an apprentice program. Um, it's being built right now. Um, it's been up and down for the last year, really trying to find, it takes the right person, it really takes the right individual who's going to put and wear that apprentice uh, suit on and really take it, take it for what it is and take it all the way home. So really trying to find the right individual to do that, but for sure, that's, that's, and that's always a great way for you to ha have hands-on learning too and learn a, a valuable skill set that you can carry on for years, you know? while adding a lot of value to a small shop. Yeah. I you know, I think it's a great idea. People don't do it nowadays as much. I think especially a lot of young people when they think about their future or a career that they want to get into, they they start with money, but it takes, you know, the, anything that you what you do, what I do, um, there's so many things that you have to learn 
And a great way that you can give something to someone at the same time that you're taking is offer to go in there, work for them for free, show them that you're really interested in this and you're willing to give them something. And then that's a fair exchange for everything that that person's giving you that it took them so much. I'm sure, you know, I was looking at a video that you have on your website. You know, it takes a lot for you to do this, even though you're an artist. To, to make a successful business out of this, you really have to focus. There's a lot of hard work that goes into focusing on the whole business aspect of it, right? A lot of balance, a lot of balance. Yeah, so what what kind of thing do you look for? Let's Because I'm, I'm trying to help out the young person out yeah. there who wants to get into something like this. And obviously I'm saying, hey, a great way to start is go be an apprentice to someone that more, most likely they're not gonna pay you at all. Yeah. Or even if they do, they'll pay you very little but it's a fair exchange. What what kind of qualities are you looking for in someone here's, to... Here's what you do. If I have any advice for, for young kids coming up and you want to get into knife making, find a shop. Again, find a knife maker, maybe someone you bought from from before, someone you believe in, right? Um, go, go to a shop, ask him if he can come help with no expectations and be ready to work because I'm telling you what, and that's possibly what happens um, when these apprentices... Uh, don't work out is the, the intensity of they don't they don't they're not ready for the labor let me just put it that way they're not ready for the labor this is not uh easy work it's back breaking it's i mean if you look at the blacksmith pick any era you know the feudal era with the the knights and everything i mean they they worked you know what i'm saying they it's it's very laborsome moving steel cutting steel grinding steel so be prepared to work and for long hours and, and to just give give because a lot of us guys in the shop were overstressed. We need labor, but we don't have labor we can trust. You know what I'm yes. saying? You come in, yeah. no expectations, not not with your hand out or nothing, and just add value and and really show that maker that you're there to do whatever it takes. That's what someone's going to look into, and then, you know, it can grow from there. But if you come in there expecting something or not patient enough, or you know, you're not ready for the intense labor that it's going to be in the long hours, then it will break somebody. Yeah, I think uh, I think we can't stress that enough. I see it a lot. I see it with my kids in in um, you know, to be truthful that they see things and they think, "Wow, this is exciting. Uh, this is cool. I want to get into this." And then they have very little patience and even though they're a lot healthier, you know, being younger, you think, "Wow, this person will be a lot healthier than me." They just don't have the patience and the focus and the stamina that it takes. They don't understand that these things are intensive. You know, it's very intensive to do this. And as a business, you're taking a chance on this person because you're actually slowing down what you're doing to start teaching them. And you really need to make sure that you trust them that you're not bringing someone into your business that that destroys it, right? And part of me as a leader also, I found that I just what you said, it takes a lot of time for me to train these people. So the first three months, I'm giving a lot. There's not, you know, a lot of times these kids work three months and they're like, okay, what are you going to give me now? I've worked for you three months. You don't understand. I've trained you for three months, which has taken a lot of time and energy, but I, I failed to communicate that with them open up. I need to start communicating more and say, hey guys, this is what the expectations are going to be. This is how, this is what it's actually taking me to, you know, you messed up the first 10 knives. You know, it was not till your 30th knife till I could at least only spend two minutes on touching it up and then it can go into production. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like they don't understand that. They don't see that. But although they are learning and progressing, you know, maybe I award them too much sometimes and it just yeah. gets okay, I'm doing good now, you know, so it's, it's, it's a little big part of it has to do with me. Now, me not being able to figure that out in the last year, who has been doing all the grinding? So I've done a lot of character building too and saying, okay, yeah. am I ready to really, you know, get someone Yeah, you've got to step up. Yeah, it, it's, it's a two-way street. I mean, that's a big thing. Like, for example, um, I deal with uh, Sam Andrews from Andrews Custom Leather. He's been making leather holsters for 40 years. And uh, we, we talk about this all the time, and he tells me when someone first comes in to the shop and they're trying to learn about leather craft, you know, he has certain jobs that he will give that person starting off. And it's really easy things that he could trust them to do because if they, if they mess up there, then he has to start that process all over again. So, you know, he, he starts them off on this thing, and then, and then 
as he begins to trust them, he can move them on. Because remember, someone is ordering this stuff, and if you're actually working on things that are going out and you mess it up, now he has to come back and, and go through that. So. That's interesting. Yeah, definitely. There has definitely been a learning curve on that. But you know what? I, and again, I still feel it, it's that right individual. They're hard to find. But guys in the shop, if you find someone good, man, you, keep, you hang on to them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So um, let's let's see. Um, for example, we were talking about time. Here's one of the things. Now, I don't have any of your stuff here with me. I do have a, a – you made this little micro axe. You remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was really cool, man. I, I, but I didn't bring it with me. So I just wanted to go through just for the sake of us talking about making things. Now, I was talking to you about this off – off camera, so I wanted to show this. This is something that I picked up here in, let me make sure I get it on here. So this is something I picked up here in Branson, actually in a, in the, um, a park called Silver Dollar City. I think it's That's one nice. of the oldest parks in the country. And you have to pay to enter there, and then it's got, you know, like roller coasters and all that cool stuff. But inside the park, there are artisans, people making glass, and uh, they're making quilts, furniture, knives like this, all kinds of things. And you can see them working on things and then buy it directly from them. That's cool. I like that stuff. Yeah, thanks. And this is a um, – so this is from DK Smith. He doesn't have a website. He doesn't have social media. <laughs> and it's basically – this is made from a railroad spike, like a rusty old railroad spike. And this this particular one is a dagger. So this is he told me that he doesn't even like making these, and he may stop making them pretty soon because uh, it's got like you know it's a blade on both sides. It has to be sharpened, and one. right. And then you know so here on the handle, it's not just turned. This is a pineapple twist, which he says is really difficult to do. Yeah, it's a way the way you score. You score it during the process when it's all heated up, you twist it, and it turns out all scaly like that. I love that. That's great. Yeah, it's amazing. So when I, you know, when I see something like this that involves so much work that someone has to do, I'll show you guys the hilt there for a second. Uh, I think it's got a marking on it. Now, have you ever, have you ever done any railroad spikes? Yeah. I, <laughs> my buddy goes caving all the time, and he just brings me boxes of railroad spikes. So I have a whole bunch of them. And, I normally beat out tongs or, or tools with them. Um, sometimes the carbon is a little low on them, so they don't hold an edge um, as is something as a one would. But they have their oh, okay. they have their place in, in the knife game. Right. Sure. So what kind of what kind of steel did you say it was again? Um, the the railroad spikes. I can't. They it depends what area you, you find the spikes at. And, you know, depending on sometimes they're D two. The D two ones are the good ones. Um, okay. But other times they're just a softer alloy. They don't have enough carbon in it um, to hold a keener edge. But again, okay. enough, to, enough to cut and process cardboard and all that. But a lot of the a lot of the knife guys they they what they will end up doing is um, forge welding a piece of uh, higher carbon steel at the edge of the knife in the spike. You know. Okay. So I think Walter's asking, I don't know if she's, uh, he's asking about your website. He's asking if you have any spike knives on your website. I don't at this time. I have spikes in my fork ready to be pounded out of the knife. Um, oh. None up on the website. Right now my website is very uh, lean just due to the fact that I'm trying to switch over the production and get a little bit more uh, volume on the website for you guys. Okay, cool. So, and then you were mentioning D two. I wish I knew about that when I was in the store because I have no, I have no, like no clue. On, oh no, on that's fine. Here's the thing: the, it's still a cutting tool edge, just because it, it can't outperform some other ones. It's just it's just different on the scale. It's a softer knife, but again, it's it, it is what it is, and, and it's right. not your fault. It's not the maker's fault. It's the spike's fault, but it's still you know you take that that tool and you would. I would love, let me put it this way, I would be enthused to have that if I was in a survival situation. It would be a godsend. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, right. it's still cutting to yeah. yeah, and and honestly, I mean, what am I going to use it for? This is going to be like a letter opener or something. You know, so in my office, I want to look cool. I'm like, yeah, check out my letter opener. <laughs> and that's fine. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Absolutely not. 
Yeah. And it, and it was still forged by someone, you know, that's still a lot of work to, to bang out a, a dagger like that. That's a lot of work. That's great. Oh, okay. I think Walter was re referring to DK DK Smith. Um, Walter, if you're listening, DK Smith told me he has no website. So if you yeah. found a website, that is not that's not DK Smith. <laughs> that I think there is someone else called DK DK Knives or something like that. But this the the gentleman that made this, his name is DK Smith. Uh, I believe he was a police officer in Fort Pierce, in Florida. Um, and then he told me that his son compete like competes for the in the Bianchi Cup, so his son is a competitive shooter. But he retired, and then he moved to this era, area here in uh, Missouri, and he makes these knives. But he has no website, he has no social media. So Walter, if you're looking at that, that's not here. We're complete. This is like a guy that you have to come to Missouri yeah. to find. <laughs> and how many more of these artisans are out there? You know what I'm saying? That just don't have anything that are just making these works of art. That you know. It's yeah, insane. I think it's amazing. It's yeah. what you know. It's what I'm, I'm hearing a little bit of feedback, at, but um, it's a it's an amazing thing about um, it, it's an amazing thing about America, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like traveling traveling through the country. These are the kinds of things that you can discover that make America mysterious and interesting. That you find these people that when they're when these people are gone, in a lot of ways, we're losing. We're losing. Right. That's crazy. Yeah. I like that you're doing that. I I, I want to take more of that spirit traveling around, and, and I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to fashion some portable, uh, I would say portable forging rig that I can pull behind a motorhome and I can. Go <laughs> That's gonna be heavy. Down. Yeah, make some yeah. knives in the back, and you know, keep trucking along like the West Coast. I think that would be great. Yeah, that um, I imagine that would be very heavy. Um, I know I've seen a portable pizza oven. <laughs> right. Yeah, there's a there's a place in Florida in Gainesville actually that they have a portable pizza oven that they take around with them, and that thing is specially reinforced. <laughs> wow. So let me uh, let me hit up some other questions here real quick. Um, from from your collection, what would you recommend to a beginner for basic EDC? I know you were showing some stuff. Just show us that again, and, and what would you recommend? Um, the Peckery you know, entry level? the line of Peckery knives um, all have these at a price point um, around one hundred and eighty with the sheath. Again, these are also the ones that are I will provide a kit where you can get for one hundred and twenty where. I can show you a YouTube video on how to paracord wrap it and how to fold the leather over it and stamp the leather clothes. So um, these would be perfect EDC kits. Again, they're small. They, they go on your belt. You, you don't even know they're on there once once you break the leather in. So very, again, utilitarian is all you're looking for when you talk EDC. How utilitarian. Okay. Practical. Cool. So is that the only thing that you have in the EDC line right now? Yeah, everything else is just huge tactical. I mean, some of the stuff weighs yeah. close to Pound. Yeah, those are beautiful though. I like those. Yeah, so for someone like Lola does uh, paracording, she's for some reason she enjoys doing the braids. It's cathartic for her, I think. Yes. So, so for someone that likes doing that, that's a good option, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you can do. Right. So, the, here's another question Does the knife industry have restricting laws like they have in firearms, in the firearms industry? Not yet. I mean, I'm sure as it gets bigger, there will be. But right. uh, yeah. well, so so for example, you so you can you can build a knife. You can build any kind of knife. I mean, I don't know. Do you make swords? You know, yes, we make swords. Yeah, um, yeah, we can build any size knife, um, whatever the customer wants. I mean, this is uh, obviously Arizona is basically the the window I'm viewing this out of. So there's a lot of more relaxed laws out here, but from yeah, you I have to be careful. You have to be careful there because folks don't know that you can pretty much do anything. <laughs> you know, you can like when it comes to there's a, lots of guns and knives that you have access to in Arizona. That's not necessarily true in other states. I think there's like blade length restrictions yeah. for what you can uh, conceal, uh, what you can have on sure. you, unless you have a concealed weapons permit. And, all sure. kinds of things. Yeah, I, I, I think there was they were referring to produ producing the knife. Right. And I don't know if that translates to manufacturing knives. If if there's if yeah. you're in a state that restricts the length of a knife you can buy, can you make that knife in California? Yeah, I don't know. 
Yeah. So, so the industry doesn't have restrictions on what you can make. Do you have to get licensing or like, for example, how those people that manufacture firearms have to, you know, be FFLs. Do you have to get those kinds of licensing to make no, knives? I don't think the knife is um, to that level yet, or I hope it never does be, but no, it's, yeah. you know, because then you're thinking, you know, what do you, butter knife, kitchen knife, like there's, there's so many different industries that would just be affected by it. Like, I feel like you just couldn't, you, I don't know how you would try to contain it to a certain style, right? Right. So do you have restrictions on what you can send? I mean, what you can ship out around the country or even more interestingly overseas? Do you, do, do you have customers overseas? No, I go through customs all the time and it's just clearly Mark Cutlery. So um, not at all. And again, every time a customer purchases something, it's, you know, know your laws, you know, this is, this is my piece of sharp art I'm creating for you, know your laws. Like, you know, so mo most of my collectors, everyone who buys, they're, they, they understand the game. If it's got to stay in the house, it's got to stay in the house. Right, absolutely. So now something that you, um, I don't know if they, I'm sure Lola will bring me any other questions. Something that I thought was interesting that you said, you said that you're always gathering different materials to make knives out of, right? Yes, yes. And, and so, mm -hmm. go ahead. No, I, I was just gonna ask you to elaborate on that. Well, there's, again, when it comes to making a knife, and that's why you can you can take knife making, and it can just it can be anything you want. You can come and you can provide an offering to this industry that no one's seen. You know, people are using exotic materials that date back, you know, ages. You know, historical materials. You know, so it's it's you you find the 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 essence of the knife and just make it make it yours. Pick whatever material you like, whether it's changing the steel, whether it's a handle. Some people use mammoth tooth. You know, there's just wow. some these historical woods. You know, this is a piece of a oak from Lincoln's barn. You know, there's stuff out there that you can really just snazz up the, the offering to the knife and make it your own. By just so what? So what kind of materials are you gathering? Um, I do uh, a lot of Damascus steel. Um, I forge well Damascus steel as well. Um, just getting into that, so there's apart from that, I use a lot of carbon fiber. There's some moon glow, some of the fancier um, G10 material or, or composites. You know, there's so much aerospace stuff out there too that you can use. It's just insane what you can do to a knife. Oh, cool. And then you were saying that, so for example, you're gathering stuff that just exists out there in the environment already and repurposing it like spikes. Yeah. You, you know, shed hunting, you can do a lot of shed hunting here in Arizona. You can find um, antlers, um, stag handles. Didn't you pick one up also? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I did actually. Now, this is from, uh, let me see. I want to make sure that I give the right credit here. So I'm going to show. Um, I did get something from uh, Ken Richardson knives, and that's this. So this is a antler, you know, and basically this is a drop point antler, and then it has a, a brass hilt there. And see, you know. G10 spacers in between the uh, antler stag and the the brass hilt. You see that there, the white and black. Um, so. Oh, that's a G10 spacer? Yeah, G10 spacers in between the antler. So the, the, that, that kind of small detail that you just keep laying into the knife just adds more value in future. That's that's good work. Right. See, I didn't even know that. If you, if you, you know, I didn't notice it. You're right, uh, but I didn't notice that small detail. So this is, yeah, this is another knife that, um, that I picked up. And I think you can get these. So Ken Richardson, the uh, family makers of knives. I don't believe that Mr. Mr. Ken Richardson, I don't, um, I think he died a few years ago, but his family is making knives. They do have a website and they have social media. And I believe that you can even get things. You can get some of these on Amazon, but they're very beautiful handmade knives. I've never, I'd never come across them before. So I thought, wow, you know, that's pretty cool. And these, these actually come with a leather sheath. I like this go. on that sheath. I really like that. See, that's great. Yeah. So, um, you know, I thought I thought it was a great buy. Not it, it wasn't anything that's that was too expensive. You know, I'm always looking for bargains. Do you know what steel uh, they used? Um, that is a good question <laughs> that you're probably asking. Uh, it's 85% uh, carbon tempered 
Blue Spring Steel. 1085. Yeah, 1085 nice Spring steel. steel. That's great steel, man. That's great steel. Is it? Okay. You uh, you'd have to you'd have to explain it to me. Yeah, that's durable stuff. It's gonna keep a good edge. You know, it might rust a little bit, but it's there's nothing that, that can't break that. Okay. So you're you're speaking of rust. I mean, what would uh I think there's things you can do to help prevent that, right? Almost like salting, salting the knife. Oil it. You can put any oil. If you're going to be cutting uh, food with it, just put natural oils on it, or you know, gun oil would even work. You know, if you're if it's just going to be a utility knife. So okay. Yeah. So if you're gonna if you're gonna use it for like cutting stuff, like cutting meat or um, things that you're eating, or like an apple or something like that, you you would use uh, mineral oil. Yep. Yep. So how would you, what's the process of going about that for people who don't know? Like, this? <laughs> well, um, you just rub it on the knife. So wipe the knife down afterwards, rub the oil on it, you know, and wipe down the excess oil. And that's it. It's just, it's just a daily maintenance thing. If, if it gets out of control, you get some rust spots on it, a tarnish you don't like, um, put, put the oil back on it and use a thousand grit sandpaper. And you can just kind of uh, scrub it off, and it kind of fade off. It's not okay. going to be a perfect finish again, but at least it's not going to have the tarnish on it. But okay. So initially, do you do that? Do you put that oil on a few times, or just do it one time? You do it a few times as you use it. Just remember, you keep it dry. You know, um, just make sure you don't put it in the holster wet. That's probably the, the quickest way to tarnish it. Okay, and I know that the guy the guy in the store was telling me that really when you store it, don't store it inside right. of the sheath. Right. All my camping knives are stored inside the sheath, but you're not. It's good practice not to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what's the reason for that? I mean, even if it's dry and you put it in the sheath, it, 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 there's still moisture created yeah, in there. Yeah. Well, in the, in the hide, it, you know, it's still leather, it's still skin. You know, I'm mm -hmm. sure their moisture get trapped in there. It's, mm -hmm. it's easier for it to tarnish. Okay. So now, um, so it seems like, so you're going to have some, some stuff made out of uh, elk horn yeah. and, or antler and stuff like that? Well, I got a couple of big elk sheds. Whoa. Okay. This one's a massive one. But I'm still concerned if I can use this one. There's Sometimes I get sun rot a little bit and there's a crack in that one. So... It's uh, I've I've built a big buoy out of a a burr and it ended up failing on me uh, two months after the customer got it. So it's you really got to pick a. Okay, so if there's a crack in there, that affects structural integrity. Yeah, it's a, there's a certain point where it gets too sun faded, where you can't use them. So this one's questionable. But if you find good sheds, and if you use them too green, they'll split on you too. You kind of got to let the shed stabilize. So after it falls off, about a year. If it sits in the woods about a year under some shady tree like this one here, I'll get a lot of good. Animals. Oh, okay. So you're so you're when you're looking for these things now. So I don't know if you, um, I don't know if you're looking for people to send you things from around the country. Probably not because you want to actually see them, right? Oh, they can send me stuff. I, I get oh, a lot can. of okay. on my following out of my antlers and I get some moose. I got a couple of guys up in Canada who always hunt oh. me stuff. Okay. So for, so you just, I think from what I just got, you said that if you're looking at something like this, you want to get something that was sitting more in the shade than sitting out in the sun. Correct. Okay. Now, this has been sun bleached and you can restain it, and but it's not the mm -hmm. stain I'm concerned about. It's more of the crack that's starting to form. I don't know if you can see it, but um, there's... Right. I mean, I like that. Now, what do you call that, like, knobby part of it? Is that the – I guess that's the part where it actually attached to the skull. Yeah, that's the burr. The burr. So that's what that's what you want to really – that's what everyone's after when they see a – they want this part because it makes a good a, a butt handle. You can put a cap on there and a pommel. You can get a through tang all the way through here and, and add a pommel to it, and it can make a really, really nice buoy handle. So, yeah, I can imagine. I mean, because I, I like things. I like the big ones because I have big, uh, relatively yeah. like. I should. I should make you one, man. We should do something. With yeah, I would love that. Cool. Have you ever used those? Have you ever made those into swords? Yeah, <laughs> sword, sword. sword. Your the your restriction on the length of blade you can do is your heat treat apparatus. So right now, 
I can only heat treat 18 inches, so I'm like bridging mini sword, you know, um, lengths. Okay. Uh, I'm right. Have you ever have you ever used the antler as a sword uh, handle? Um. Yeah, I have. It, well, it was more of a buoy, I guess. You know, it was an 18. Like a big buoy, yeah, like a yeah, Rambo style. So. <laughs> yeah. Mini sword. yeah. But right, definitely, right. that would be great. Could you imagine a two-handle sword right here? Wow. Yeah. Top. Now you just you just gave me an idea. All right. Yeah, um, it's and it will be called the Hank. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, listen, I'm always spitballing yeah, ideas. Half with it though for me. Yeah. Okay. I'm I'm cool with that. So um, Walter wants to know Walter from Safety Harbor Firearms. I don't know whether or not you met him. I can't remember if I introduced you to him at Shot Show. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, Safety it's Harbor Firearms. They they sponsor my channel. They they make some cool guns. They actually make. A 50 BMG upper that you can put on an AR lower. Oh wow! You know, yeah. So you can get into a 50 at a very reasonable price. He's wow. a good guy. Wow. Yeah, great gun guy. He's a uh, you know also a tank guy. If you're if you ever need to know anything about heavy World War II machinery. <laughs> oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, Walter is an awesome dude. So he wants to know: Have you ever uh, reused large circular sl uh, saw blades? Circular oh. saw blades. I haven't personally. I've seen people who've done it. It works. It's the same kind of steel. It's um, just mystery steel. You just it's it's hit or miss. Sometimes it depends when the air, when the steel was made. A lot of these manufacturers didn't stamp the, the type of steel. So if you could get a good spring steel or a good D two, you're gonna make a phenomenal blade out of it. But it's just you never know. You grind it. You know. Sometimes I mix up steel I buy in the shop, and you, you don't know where it is until you grind it out and heat treat it. Yeah, and someone was asking about lawnmower blades. I don't know if they were. I don't know if they want a lawnmower blade made specially like this. That would be insane. That grass would be so neat. <laughs> but um, do you ever use things like lawnmower blades? Yeah, you can turn knives into lawnmower blades for sure, for sure, for sure. Okay, and so from from lawnmower from lawnmower blades, you can make them into knives. Lawnmower blades, saw blades, spring steels in your car. Um, ball bearing steel chainsaw steel all this stuff can make hardened tool edge if you if you if you know how to melt it down and beat it into a knife for okay sure. so what are the coolest found things like that that you you know i'm just wondering like what would be the coolest things i know i, I hate to go back to it i know you said that you did some spikes you know maybe there's folks out there that want spikes yeah well it's spike knives learn on listen you guys if you want to get into forging um, and you pick up a spike, go to uh, go to uh, one of those antique stores and pick up a, a railroad spike for a dollar. I think they sell them for a dollar, two dollars. And you're going to see how hard it is to move that metal. You just need practice. So right now, you, you need to be accurate enough to hit this, this stuff flat. You need to know the science of moving steel. You just can't pound steel. There's there's a way that you can manipulate it on the anvil to stretch it, you know. So there's... There's a science behind it. Learn it on the spikes for sure, and then once you're once you're ready, bite down on that you know half inch by three quarter inch O1 tool steel. That's gonna bang you out a very nice sharp neck knife. You know what I'm saying? But after you got some time under the under the hammer. Yeah, because what I'm what I'm assuming that you have to melt this. You have to melt it to a certain level, and then you have to be able to hammer it out in a certain way, right? If you're forging, if you're doing stock removal, then you're just you're buying the right machinery, or you're doing it with a, ha a hacksaw. I mean, you can sit there and lay out your knife on a bar stock, you know, eighth inch by two inch piece of bar stock, or one tool steel bar stock. Lay out the profile of the knife, and then go with a hacksaw. I mean, how much how how much do you want this knife versus how much tools you want to throw at it? You know, money you're gonna throw at it to make it happen. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I can imagine that. So what would, what's your favorite element um, or something maybe that you, you have coming up that you guys are going to make into knives? Well, like, like that would said, be a cool, uh, a cool series of knives I that you have coming up. The next thing I'm going to be doing, you're inspiring me to do this, Hank, is cut up these antlers, stag antlers, and really go into the process of forging out a knife from all those materials you were just talking about, I just I just purchased a whole bunch of 1085 spring leaf steel from an automotive shop. You know, guys, you just gotta get creative, you know. A lot of these guys are throwing the scrap away and, or you can pick up a couple scraps for 20, 40 bucks and it can make a great knife. So I'm gonna take that, 
hopefully bang it on something that looks sharp. I want to pour a copper guard. So I'm right now my foundry outside. I'm revamping my foundry. I'm making a new, uh, it's going to be basically a hot lava machine. <laughs> it makes hot lava. It turns wow. copper into hot lava. <laughs> and okay. I'm going to pour my own hand guards um, and uh, attach these, uh, all these antler handles into it. So I really want to um, combine the forging, the smelting, and the antler stag into, I don't know, I could probably make at least 20 knives out of these handles. So that you're going to see me documented on YouTube. Thank oh, you. cool. Yeah. And, and for anyone that wants to know, I am going to be doing some stuff with Blake. You know, I met him, uh, I think I was, Shockwave. where did I meet you? Shockwave, I think. Come yeah, shockwave, shockwave in the desert. Um, last year, I, I went out to Arizona for. Yeah, you were uh, Ken, were you? yeah, you know what? Actually, yes, I was. I think I met you through Ken, who's a good guy. Ken is from K and M Arms. For anyone who knows about Ken out there, very nice guy. He introduced me to you. I was there. I went to Shockwave. He invited me to come out to Shockwave, but I was in Arizona for the Henry Thousand Man shoot. That's right. Yeah, and then I think I also went to the SEMA show, and then came, like so I was I went through Arizona, went to SEMA show, then came back for the Thousand Man shoot there, and that's how we met. So I am, you know, I would love to come out and do some stuff. We do how it's made videos on my channel. It's my favorite videos to do, and I think they're also the most popular videos that we have on the channel. People really enjoy seeing things being made, and some of the, those videos go from half an hour up to like an hour and ten minutes or an hour and a half sometimes, you know, and people enjoy that. So I would love to do something with you. We've got to make plans for that. For sure. For sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I can't wait. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, and what I'll do this time, just so that I'm not busy running around doing a bunch of crazy stuff, I will actually come out there specifically <laughs> to do this with you. you I know, know because we tried. It was both of us. We were just. Uh, it was a busy time, but it was fun. It was great. great yeah, time. absolutely. I mean, for people who don't know, um, the the tagline for for Blake is "Good knives, good vibes," right? And you're and you're a really good, cool, mellow, mellowed out guy. Are you a Californian? Yeah, you know I actually am. Uh, I was born in California no. when I was two, so I'm basically, yeah. a, you know. But yeah, De yeah, that's cool, man. That's, yeah, you've got a real laid back attitude. I like that. <laughs> so you know, I, I, um, you know, I don't want to keep you here on the line doing this all day. You know, I think we got a lot of good information here. Uh, are there anything, anything that you wanted to cover before I wrap up? Maybe you want to show us some of those knives. People really like that Tonto blade. So if you could just hold that up and show us that, uh, the, the copper on there is beautiful. If you can just talk to us about that. Yep, that's it. This is uh, my Tonto, my BMH Tonto guy. So I'm, I'm really focusing now moving from a custom knife maker for making one-off customs to a small production line, but still doing my Blake signatures. Um, on the side, either raffling them off or um, taking smaller custom orders, but really focusing on producing a smaller um, production line of knives that I can feed everyone with in-house. So look out for that. Check it out on Instagram, BMH Knives, and uh, soon to be on YouTube, hanging out with you, Hank. Absolutely. So um, what? So that that blade, that uh, knife that you're showing there, that Tonto. What does something like that cost? You you still got those, right? You're still selling. Yes, them. I still got this. So this this is a higher end custom with all the file work on it and everything. Let me just give you a range. They start at three fifty and they move up uh, in the upwards of twelve hundred. But it, but again, being being that it's so customizable, you you know we're talking when you're switching. Um, the Tsuba to Timascus, which the part itself is $90, $80. You know, you're talking of higher end collectible materials. We can right. get that crazy if you want, or we can scale it back. And eventually, my production line of Tonto is the whole system locked and loaded with this sheath. I want to be around uh, 250 which is a very, very doable system right. with what you get with the blade and the scales, the Tsuba, the Fuchi, all handmade. So, yeah, very cool. That. Very cool. What what I'm I'm actually I would like to get I got this idea from a movie or something. I would like to get two lightweight Tonto blades that I can have in a sheath in my back. Nice. And then I could just like take yes. out two Tonto. Totally. <laughs> yeah, that I'd like to get a rig like that at some point. So absolutely. Um, 
And I know, you know, one of the things I think that's cool with you, you're always like giving away some cool stuff to the folks out there that follow you. So sure. maybe for the people who watch this all the way through to the end, do we have some cool things we can give away from BMH? You know, um, you can send them out to me and then I'll send them out to folks Absolutely. out there. Absolutely. I do a lot of um, print art, you know, I also involve a lot of my uh, painting and art into the knives. So right now I always do for my following a win-win raffle where I'm raffling off knives, I'm raffling off print art, um, hand forged bottle openers, you know, so yeah. it, it, it always pays, but I can give you a whole stack of uh, superhero stuff. Yeah. You know, um, let me. Yeah, we'll put, so here's what I'll do guys for everyone who's still watching this, you know, just to show that we appreciate you guys watching this, I'll get some stuff from Blake together and we'll put some little packets together. So for, you know, we'll try to do that for some folks out there who like and share this. What's that? That's a Deadpool print. So yeah, I'm doing a limited run of prints of these. So I can give you uh, the runs of 80 through 90. Hank, how about I do that? Oh, and wow. Awesome. That's amazing. That. To, yeah, thank uh, you. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, so for the folks out there, that looks like, so that's like 10 of them, right? That's 10 of them. I'll give you 10. I'll send yeah. You. So, so 10 folks out there, we'll put together, Lolo put together package for the, for the 10 folks out there who actually like this video on YouTube and share it out on some kind of social media, you know, and just mention us in there, tag us somehow so that we know that you did it. Also tag BMH Knives. And uh, definitely don't forget to go to his Instagram. This guy is like prolific on Instagram. Okay. And I want to, I want to thank everyone for, you know, for tuning into the show. We probably, I'm not sure that we're going to be able to do one of these tomorrow because we're going to be on the road, headed back to uh, Tallahassee. We've got to drop off one of the boys at FSU. My, my older son is going to FSU. So, <laughs> you know, that's, that's, uh, a that's cool exactly. thing for us out there. Yeah, he's a Seminole. I know that, you know, I'm from, we're, we live in Gainesville, so there's people that every time I say this, they get mad, you know, they're gators. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure I'm going to get like, how come you didn't make him a gator? Well, you know, he, yeah, and... you chose him. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I just want to let everyone know that. Please go and check out BMH Knives. Blake's a good guy. Any last words, Blake, before I stop the live broadcast here? That's it, man. If you're look, looking into getting into the game, go for it. It's a, it's it's great, and just just spread the good vibes, man. That's all. That's all you gotta do. Good nice good vibes for sure. Great, thank you. Yeah. So I just want to thank everyone that supports me. Um, obviously, Big Daddy Guns, who is like really come on board here and supporting us, but also Safety Harbor Firearms, Rand CLP, and. Um, as I mentioned before, Andrew's custom leather and the, the great folks out there that support us on Patreon, you know, we really, we really need that help and we really appreciate it on Patreon. We are Patreon slash Hank Strange and definitely check out BMH knives. Good knife, good vibes, good knives, right? Good knives, good vibes. All right. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Guys. Appreciate it. <laughs>